Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A very significant word is the word integrity. Integrity has to do with a set of beliefs that you are absolutely committed to. And no matter what happens, you will not change that, that commitment. And that's Paul. And what Paul had integrity for was the gospel of Messiah Yeshua. He understood the power of it. He understood the outcome of it. And he understood that there was no hope outside this gospel. And for that, he was willing to endure all things. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Ephesians and chapter 3. Notice how Paul writes in this third chapter. He speaks about his condition. Now, we have studied verse by verse the book of Galatians. Now we're approaching the halfway point in the book of Ephesians. And both of these books, along with Philippians and Colossians, Paul wrote while he was in prison. And that's why he says, chapter 3, verse 1, On account of this, I, Paul, the bondservant of Messiah, so Paul is writing this, he is suffering, not just confined in prison, but more often than not, being in prison meant punishment, physical punishment. If, if someone wasn't looking out for you, bringing your food, you would go hungry. I mean, in this condition, no one cared. And Paul endured great hardship. And notice what he says about this, once again, verse 1. On account of this, meaning this gospel, what the outcome is, this, this peace, this, this power that he mentions in the previous chapter. He says, on account of this, I, Paul, am a bondservant of Messiah in your behalf, who? The Gentiles. Now, why does he emphasize that? Well, he emphasizes it because Paul, as we talked about last week, Paul is personifying Israel in this, this epistle. He is demonstrating what a faithful Israelite is called to do. And that is, just like we've talked about over and over, God created Israel supernaturally to be a blessing to the nations, to be a light to the Gentiles. Paul's saying, because of God's call of that ultimate kingdom, he says, I'm willing to endure prison in behalf of you, the Gentiles. Why? That's what Israel was called, created to do, to be used by God for the purpose, the spiritual benefit of the Gentiles. Verse 2. Also, if you have heard of, and he uses a word, the same word, economy, this administration of the grace of God which was given to me for you. So Paul's saying, you know, I was called in a special way to take this gospel to you. And this special way is what Paul has hit over and over in the first chapter of Galatians and in the first chapter of Ephesians that he is an apostle, one that was sent by God with this purpose. And when he says here, I'm in prison, he says, I'm only doing what God has called me to do. And Paul is relying upon the sovereignty of God. If God wants him to be in prison, that's where Paul's willing to be. So he says, you have heard of this administration of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Verse 3, that according to revelation, now here again, I love this because to whom God has called, there's going to be revelation. That is, God is going to give us truth, a truth that guides us, a truth that shapes us into the people that He wants us to be. And why is that so important? Because all too often, people are pleading with God. They're trying to negotiate with God. They're praying to God, God, make me the person that I want to be. Give me the things that I want. Move me forward on the pathway of life that I am setting upon, not what God has done. Paul is very different from that. So he says, verse 3, 
according to revelation that was made known to me the mystery. That mystery which he says I have written a few words about earlier. Now, what is that? Well, two things. The mystery of Messiah. And part of that has to do with Israel. Why do I say that? The mystery of Messiah that he's referring to here is one aspect of his role in bringing Gentiles into the commonwealth of Israel. You see, so often we see that Judaism doesn't see that. Judaism isn't interested in that today. Judaism doesn't see any responsibility to the nations. In fact, quite the contrary. The attitude of most rabbis is, you know, you can just go after whatever you want. If, if you want to be in, in this religion, go ahead, or that religion. In fact, much of Judaism teaches, which is a apostasy before God, and that is many ways into the kingdom of God. We don't see that in the scripture. We don't see that in, in the writings of the prophets. We see that God has made forth one way, his redeemer. And he's a redeemer of both the Jew and the Gentile. So Paul says, I've written a few words about this, verse 4, to which you might be able to read and to understand my knowledge in this mystery of Messiah. So here he says, without any doubt, this mystery of Messiah, which, verse 5, which in earlier generations, or literally in other generations, which was not made known to the sons of man, but now it is revealed to the saints. And notice how he speaks of saints here. He ties those who are saints to two things, one of which is the teachings of the apostles, but here's what may be surprising to us, also the teachings of the prophets. As we talked about last week, there is one message. There is not a new covenant message that is, is not congruent with the Old Testament message. In the New Testament, we're able to see that message of the prophets clearer. It is fleshed out. And why do I want to say fleshed out? One word, the gospel. Now, we've alluded to the gospel. Paul has used that term a few times. But we really haven't defined the gospel. Now, there's one gospel. It's the plan of redemption. The outcome of that plan is salvation, justification. But the Hebrew word for gospel is the word hapsora. And it's oftentimes translated into English as glad tidings or good news. Well, I have no objection to that, except we miss out on the nature of that word. The word levaser means to proclaim the good news. But why is it a word levaser? What do we see there? The word basar. The Hebrew word basar is flesh. And it refers to the flesh of God. Wait a second. I thought the scripture says God is spirit. He is. But, but God became flesh. That's the good news. He became flesh in the person of Messiah. Now, Messiah always existed. One of the things that I cannot say too much is a theological truth, and that is there was never a time that Yeshua did not exist. He's eternal, not just in the future, but also in the past. In fact, when we get into the book of Colossians, we're going to see that the creator of all things is God the Son, Yeshua, and not God the Father. So he created all things. Messiah Yeshua was not created. There was never a time he did not exist. So what he says here in verse, verse 5, he says, This was, was never made known in any of the other generations to the sons of men, but now being revealed to the saints, who are the saints? Those who understand the revelation of the apostles and the prophets, same revelation, having been fleshed out in the person of Messiah and revealed to us today by whom? By the Spirit, in the Spirit. Verse 6, that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of what? The promise. How? What does it say? In Messiah Yeshua. Now, here again, Paul writes and he writes about all of these wonderful things that we can have. And they're all conditional about being in Messiah Yeshua. 
without that being a reality in your life, you are without hope. And even though you might be part of a covenant people, meaning that you might be Jewish, that, that covenant promise will not be realized. Why? Well, understand that covenant promise is conditional. It is founded on a truth. What covenant promise am I speaking to? The one that is inherently related to Israel. Abrahamic's covenant, which it says is conditional upon that seed. And that seed, we learned this last, uh, last study when we were in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 16. That seed is one, meaning Messiah, not many, meaning the house of Israel. It is founded to the house of Israel, but on Messiah Yeshua. And that's why he writes that we become fellow heirs. That word heir, inherently related to the kingdom. Why do I say that? Well, because the word heir in Hebrew, I realize this is Greek, but the context, the foundation of understanding the New Testament, which was written in Greek, is Hebrew. Why do I say that? The words, the terminology. And the word for heir is the word yoresh. Yud resh shin. It is the, the, the word where we get the word Yerushalayim from, Jerusalem. Jerusalem means to inherit peace. And peace is the fulfillment of God's will. What are we talking about? Kingdom. So the term heir is inherently related to the kingdom of God. Verse, verse 6 once more. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Messiah by means of what? By means of the gospel. Verse 7. And then he writes which I have become a minister according to the gift of grace of God, which was given to me according to, and I love this, according to the effectual working, that's what it literally says, the effectual working of his power. Now, once again, he talks about earlier the promise of what? His spirit. And now he speaks about the effectual working of his power. Don't miss the relationship between these two. The Spirit of God and the effectual working of the power of God, the Spirit of God. Verse, verse 8. To whom, and now Paul's going to get real personal. Paul's going to share with us that him being of a very important lineage, Paul could trace his lineage back to the tribe of Benjamin, Paul was a Pharisee among Pharisees of the strictest sect. Paul was trained under the rabbi Gamaliel. Paul was a champion in what we would call pharisaical or rabbinical Judaism. But what does he say? All of that accounted for nothing. Why? Because all of that caused him to do one thing, and that is to, to struggle against the plans and the pur purpose and the person of Messiah Yeshua. And he says, verse 8, to me, all of this became a reality, he says, to me who is the least of all, meaning all the apostles. He says here, of all the saints, which was given to, to him grace. The same grace that was given to the nations, which was proclaimed, and what is what I like? It was proclaimed the unsearchable, the unsearchable richness that is found in Messiah. Now, this is one of the things I think is a great pursuit, to seek, to pursue the unsearchable richness of the grace of God. And, and what we're going to find is this. When we pursue that, you know what we're doing? We're pursuing God because of this, this connection between the grace of God and Messiah. When you pursue grace of God, you are pursuing and you're going to be experiencing the intimacy of Messiah. Verse 9, and he is going to enlighten all with this, this some Bibles say fellowship, but it's the same word, this, this administration of the mystery that was hidden from this world by God unto what? He says, this mystery that was hidden by God to all which things which uh, created, the God who created, excuse me, all things, in order that we might know now the 
principalities and the authorities in the heavens by means of the church. Now, this is an important aspect. In fact, probably the most spiritual thing that Paul is saying right now is this right here. He talks about how it's going to be the body of Messiah, those who are called out of this world by means of the grace of God through faith that become partakers in the Spirit of God that we're going to have a very important role. Look again at this verse. Let's end with the end of verse 9. It says, this was hidden from uh, this age by God, who is the creator of all things, in order that it might be made known now to the principalities and the authorities. Let me ask you, how has Paul, how has Paul spoken of these principalities and authorities previously? At those in this present age, those who, those who stand against the purposes of God. And what he's saying here is that God has an instrument in this dispensation, this age. And this, this instrument is the body of believers, which is comprised of both Jew and Gentile. And notice what he says. He mentions this promise, and then he talks about the Spirit of God, and he mentions this, this great power, this mighty power. And what's it going to do? It is going to make all of God's plans and purposes aware to those principalities and authorities and lordships and whatever we want to say that stand in opposition. It is going to be us, the believers, who are going to be used by God to bring them into submissiveness. Now, where is this found elsewhere in the scripture? Well, in the book of Revelation. When he talks about us being more than conquerors. And this word conquerors is really, many of you own tennis shoes, and the brand name is Nike. And that's what this word for conqueror, but it's literally also understood as the victorious ones. And only those who are going to know the outcome of God's covenant promises are only ones who are going to know that are those who are experiencing victory. And that's what Paul is saying. Victory over the enemy of this age. And what's going to be the outcome? Well, he says here, and we are going to be of the, the same household, or should say here, of the multifold expression of the wisdom of God. Now, this multifold expression has to do with, I mentioned household, but it's really the word for being built up. That God is going to build up through many different ways His people in what? In wisdom, the very wisdom of God. What's He talking about here? He's talking about the fact that He wants to give to us the mind of God. What does that mean? It means that we need his perspective on things. We need to see things from his point of view. Now, a few weeks ago, we studied the book of Jonah. And when we talked about Jonah in that first chapter, when he was rebelling against God, when he was fleeing from the presence of God, what was that key verb? Down, Loretta. He went down, 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 and literally he went into almost a, a trance. Of, of falling into a deep slumber. Well, what does Paul allude to now? Well, Paul is going to talk about an upward call in Messiah Shore. And this is what he's referring to here when he talks about having the mind, the perspective, seeing things from God's point of view. We need to be raised up so that we can see things and respond to it according to the truth of God. Look on to verse 11 according to his eternal purpose, which he did, how? <laughs> Again, in Messiah Yeshua. So what he says here is this. There is absolutely no way that you can be part of God's eternal purposes apart or separated from Messiah Yeshua. So over and over in this passage of Scripture, he's reiterating the, the blessings, the, the privilege, the benefits of being in Messiah Yeshua. So he says, according to the eternal purposes which he has done in Messiah Yeshua are, and he hasn't said this for a while, our Lord. Lord is synonymous with submissiveness. And Paul is trying to uh, counteract something because for many, many verses, he's talked about knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And, and the, the danger is this. 
that we come to a point of view where we think it's all about knowing. No. What it's about is knowing and submitting to that, that it might have its way in our life. That this truth, this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding might be manifested not in simply a knowledge, but in a behavior. And that knowledge, that wisdom is going to cause us to understand who Messiah is. That he's Lord, that we need to submit to him. And then finally, we're going to close with verse 12, in which we have the boldness. Now, we have this power, we have this call, but it won't do any good unless we are bold in this world. Remember what he's just told us. He's told us how God has set us apart that he might use his body of believers, those who are called out, the church, that we might bring down the authorities and principalities of this age. And that's why he says that we need to be bold, and not only should we be bold, but the reason for being bold is what he says in the next phrase. And he gives us access. See, the only reason we have boldness is that we have access to God. That we are not alone in this world. That we have his anointing upon us. And we are named by his name. And therefore, he says, we have also what? Security or confidence by means of the faith of him. Now, why does he say that? The faith of him. When he gives us, that is Messiah Yeshua. When we, faith is not just a, a belief, but it's a belief that bears out in a conduct. Now, we're not saved by that conduct, but we're saved for that conduct. So he says here that we're going to have a confidence or a boldness, that we're going to have access, and we have security by means of faith in him. What is that? Well, what comes to my mind is the fact that God promises never to leave us nor forsake us. He says, lo, I am with you until the end of this age. What's he talking about? Until the establishment of the kingdom. And what I like about the kingdom is where the throne is. You see, right now the throne is in the heavens. But the, 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 acts, the emphasis of the kingdom of God is that the throne leaves heaven and comes into this world. The throne of God coming into this world transformed this wor world into the kingdom. So he says that we have, have confidence or boldness and access and security by means of the faith of him. And that causes us, let's look at one more verse, that by means of this we should ask and not be faint-hearted in my afflictions for you, which is your glory. Now, this is a very important statement. Paul says that this is this affliction. He says, you shouldn't grow up faint-hearted in the fact that I'm suffering. You know why he says that? Because he says, in a little while, you're going to go through that same thing. And let me share with you that we are approaching a dispensation when we look at certain of the testimony of the prophets. And what's going to come about in the last days, you can be assured that in the same way that the world put Paul in prison, they didn't want his message. They didn't want that, that, that transformation. They didn't want to see the principalities and the authorities of this age be, be put asunder. In that same way, we are at the horizon of a time when this world is going to rise up against the message of Messiah. We are living on the threshold. When Messiah said, they hated me, they'll hate you, for, for many decades, this hasn't been the case throughout much of the world. But wow, how things change in these last few years. We are living at a time, and I'm talking about the year 5775 or 2015, where there is a great increase of persecution for those who named the name Messiah. So Paul understood this. Paul's kingdom-minded. He's thinking that the kingdom is near, and he says, basically, get ready for this, because it's going to be for your glory. What is that? Paul's saying this. He says, you know, don't grow faint-hearted because I am suffering for you. Don't let that discourage you. Don't let that move you across from, from, from the truth. He says, because. 
in a short while, you are going to be called to endure that same thing for other people. So don't be faint-hearted in light of my suffering. In fact, it's when you realize that I'm suffering for you and that, that, that changes you, that impacts you, that humbles you. And that's going to be the cause for where God is going to manifest His glory through you and in you. Now, let me just begin to wrap up this message by saying this. I began our study of the book of Ephesians speaking about how theologically illiterate the church has become. We, we, we want to hear messages that's really just a glorified counseling. Counseling the imaginations, the thoughts, the wisdom of men shaped and, 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 and wrapped up in, in religious terms and biblical language. Uh, without the power and the anointing of the Spirit. What I want you to see is this, that the Spirit of God works best when we are in His Word, allowing His Word to speak to us. Not what we think people should hear, but what God has inspired His holy prophets, what He inspired His apostles to write down, that the man of God might be equipped for what? For every good work. And it's only when we rely upon the truth of Scripture that the anointing and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit will be upon us so that we can stand faithful no matter what we may encounter. And a great example of that is the Apostle Paul himself. Can you imagine writing such powerful words, words of anointing, words of revelation, and God is doing all of this in him and through him. Where? When Paul is in chains in a Roman prison. And I think that's so significant because it tells us that the chains of this world do not enslave us. What really enslaves a man is his own pride, his own selfishness, his own fleshly desires for, for the desire to be something instead of. To be, to be a servant of God. You know, Moses was called throughout the Torah a servant of the Lord. He was also spoken of as the most humble among men. I think these two things go together, humility and being a servant. And Paul was demonstrating this humility when he wrote to this group the truth of the gospel. Well, we're out of time until next week. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.